Okay, they're still giving us a workout on equilibrium constants here, but now they're working backwards. They're saying, we'll give you a K, and you figure out what reaction it must have come from. So we know that when we get a K, all the things that are in the numerator are products, and everything in the denominator is reactants. So for this first one, we must have had, we're making HCN, hydrogen cyanide, and our reactants are hydrogen and C2N2. And what did I miss? There's a power of 2 on the hydrogen cyanide, which must mean down here there's a coefficient of 2. Now, we could have gotten that by balancing this thing manually, and we would have found that we had to double this to make the rest of the reaction make sense, but it's much easier to just pull those out of the K. So that takes care of the first one. If we go over here, our products are methane and hydrogen sulfide. The fact that there's a power of 2 on the H2S means it has a coefficient of 2 down here. For reactants, we have carbon disulfide, coefficient of 1, and hydrogen with a coefficient of 4. There we are. The product here is nitrous bromide. N-O-B-R. Power here is 2, so we get a coefficient of 2 there. Here we have nitrogen monoxide. Power of 2, so this gets a coefficient of 2. And bromine. Power of 1, as in they didn't write a power, so here a coefficient of 1, or you could not write the coefficient. It's the old invisible 1 thing. And... Do you notice these are reciprocals of each other? Do you remember what that means? If you reverse a reaction, it gives you the reciprocal K. So we can expect this reaction to be the exact opposite of this one. But let's pretend we don't know that. and We'll just do this from the Ks, because that's what we're practicing. So we have NO as one of our products. Power of 2 means this had a coefficient of 2. The other product is bromine. Uh, coefficient of, sorry, power of one here means coefficient of one down here, meaning no need to write it. And for our reactants, we have nitrous bromide. And because of the power of two, there must be a coefficient of two here. And sure enough, these two reactions are reverses of each other, as expected from the case. Okay, this is a number crunch. They give us a reaction. They tell us the K is 0 0.042, and we know that the equilibrium law is it would be phosphorus trichloride times chlorine. These both have power coefficients of 1, so there's powers of 1 over here. And our reactant is phosphorus pentachloride. Again, power of 1. And they tell us that comes out to 4.2 times 10 to the minus 2, which is 0 0.042. And now they give us numbers. Notice they're using odd units here. Instead of moles per liter like we normally have, they're using kilomoles per liter, a thousand times greater. So these are ridiculously concentrated gases. That's not really going to change our calculation. It just means when we get a, a concentration at the end of this, it's also going to be in kilomoles per liter. And we might adjust that. We'll see. All right, so they say PCL3, which I don't know. I'm just going to call it X, times chlorine is 0 0.049. Over PCL5 is 0 0.012. So because these units are both kilomoles per liter, that means it's okay. I don't have to change anything. It just means I have to remember when I write my answer. It's not plain old moles per liter. It also will be kilomoles per liter. So we have all this, PCL3, CL2, PCL5, and all that equals 0 0.042. That's our equilibrium constant. So if we are to solve this for x, 
I can multiply both sides by 0 0.012. That'll get rid of that. It'll leave me with 0 0.049x on the left side. And on the right, I'll get 0 0.042 times 0 0.012. Zero point, I get triple O five O four. There we are. And then we divide both sides by point oh four nine. And we get X is zero point zero one zero three. And our units are kilomoles per liter. Now, if you don't want it to be kilomoles per liter, kilo means a thousand. You could simply multiply this number by a thousand, and that would get you 10.3 moles per liter. And that's equivalent, so it should be fine. Which of the following changes would affect the value of a system's equilibrium constant? Here. Real quick, I'll make you a list. Things that can change the value of a, an equilibrium constant. Okay, there is our list of things that can change a K. Adding reactants and products does not matter. Changing the pressure does not matter. Changing the pressure by pumping in inert gas does not matter. The only things that affect a K are heat it up or cool it down. this for a hypothetical reaction blah the equilibrium constant is 0 0.145 they mention a temperature notice we, we just said that temperature k is changed with temperatures so it's good manners if you're giving a k to say I measured this k at the following temperature so then if someone goes oh well I'm doing this at room temperature that k may not be right for me now we don't get into a lot of detail about that in this course but expect whenever you see a K, if they're doing a diligent job of presenting their information, they should say this K was measured at a temperature of something. So we're not going to use this, but it's good to see that it's there anyway. What is the equilibrium constant for? Now, remember this? This is a reverse reaction. So for the forward reaction, I'll do this in probably a little too much detail. The K would have been Z squared over x squared and over y to the third. And that came out to 0 0.145. For this reaction, if you write a k, I'll, for this one I'll put forward, and for this other one I'm going to put reverse. We get x squared, and then we get y to the third. over z squared. You can see that this k and this k are reciprocals of each other. That means this number and this number must be reciprocals of each other. So this number would be 1 over 0 0.145. How do I figure that? Well, you can always make a number a fraction by putting it over 1. So 0.145 is technically the same as 0.145 over 1. And now that it's a fraction, we can flip it. We're saying this k has been flipped, so the number must also have been flipped. And if you want to get this number in a nicer form, you just go to the calculator and do 1 divided by 0.145. And that gives, what is it, 6 point... This had 3 sig digs, so this one to 3 sig digs would be 6.90. 6 6.90. Okay. We've talked about equilibrium constants, and we've said that the size of the equilibrium constant tells you if your reaction favors its reactants or its products. If the K is very big, and by big I mean bigger than 1, yeah, I'm not going to write big K, I'll put larger than K larger than 1. And I'm going to say, yeah, just k larger than 1. We say that the reaction favors the products. When, when the reaction's over, there's going to be more products than there are reactants. So 
So we could say it favors the products, or the other thing we'd say is that the equilibrium is to the right. Favors products, or equilibrium is to the right. If k is less than 1, then we say it favors the reactants. or that the equilibrium is to the left. So the bigger a k is, the more product you're going to get, and the smaller a k is, the less product, more reactant you're going to get. k's are never negative, and they should, generally they won't be zero either, but you can get k's that are like 10 to the minus 7 or something like that, so that means a reaction that hardly goes at all. And they're just asking us here which of these favor the products and which ones favor the reactants. Well, the bigger they are, the more they favor the products. So what's the biggest one on here? Funny thing is, these powers, which are the most important part of the whole thing, are all negative. So none of these k's are particularly big. They're all less than 1. But negative 1 is the highest that we get here. We have a couple of negative 2s, a negative 3, and a negative 4. So well, all these k's are pretty wimpy. K4 is the biggest one. K4 favors reactants the most. After that, uh, we have a couple of them at negative 2. So their powers are both negative 2. If the powers are the same, then you use the Mantessa here as a tiebreaker. 3.9 versus 4.2 means 4.2 wins. K5 is the next biggest one. It was a tie as far as their powers, but 4.2 beats 3.9, so you always look at the power first, and if you can't decide based on the power, then you go to the decimal number. Uh, let's see, after 4.2 would, would be the 3.9, that's the next. So K2 is our middle of our list. So now I've used 2, 5, and 4. Negative 3 is the next highest power, so K1 is our next one on the list. And K3 is the absolute smallest, because it has the lowest power, meaning it's the one that favors the reactants the most. So this is favors the reactants the most, second most, this one's in the middle, favors the product second most, and favors products the most. What have they got here? The equilibrium constant for this reaction is 82 and they give us temperature, good for them. Okay, so I'll just whip up a K here because I suspect we're going to need it. The K for this is the product, ammonia, squared, over nitrogen, and hydrogen to the third power. And they tell us that should always come out to 82 if you're at equilibrium. Okay, we have an 8-liter vessel with 4 moles of hydrogen and 5 moles of ammonia, and so I guess we don't know the nitrogen. We must find that. Now, what is wrong with doing this? Four for hydrogen. Put the powers on. Why is that no good? I hope you weren't Hope you weren't doing that. Remember, these have to be concentrations, and what they've given us here are not concentrations. They just gave us numbers of moles. We have to fix these before we can go on. And we fix them using our trusty concentration formula, which says concentration is number of moles divided by volume. Our volume is 8 liters. So for ammonia, our concentration is going to be there are 5 moles of ammonia, divided by the volume is 8, that gives 0 0.625 moles per liter for ammonia's concentration. For hydrogen, we can do that again. Its number of moles is 4, the volume is still 8, all these things are in the same container. 4 divided by 8 gives us 0 0.5 moles per liter, that's the concentration of hydrogen. Now we can carry on. So, this 5 is not the right thing. Don't do that. Don't get caught by moles. These have to be concentrations. Uh, okay, ammonia, 0 0.625. The 
nitrogen is just x, don't know it yet, and hydrogen is 0 0.5. So if we're going to solve this for x, bit of a mess, 0.625 gives 0 0.390625. Just going to do as much calculation as I can to get it out of the way. 0.5 to the third is 0 0.125. And we have our x. I put the, the number in front of the x because that's what I'm used to. And that has to come out to 82 because that's our equilibrium constant. OK, so let's solve that for x. I'm going to clear this out because I need the space. If we multiply both sides by 0.125, we get, on the left, we just get 0 0.390625. On the right, we get 0 0.125 times 82, which is 10.25. And to finish solving this for x, we divide both sides by 10.25. So 0 0.390625 divided by 10.25, 0 0.0381. You know what? These only had two significant digits, so I should only go to two with the answer. 0 0.038 ought to do it. And again, the units for that, because it's a concentration, are moles per liter. Are we done? What do you think? When I ask if we're done, we're generally not done. Here's the catch. They didn't want a concentration this time like they normally do. They say how many moles of nitrogen are present. The concentration helps, but it's not the finished product. The number of moles of something equals its concentration times its volume. In this case, we have 0 0.038 moles in every liter of space. And there are 8 liters of space. So multiply that, 0 0.038 times 8. And I get that there are 0 0.304 moles of nitrogen. Usually we stop at concentration, because that's what the K formula works with. But we could ask you to go this extra step.